Hello Duelists, it's Tom Box here coming at you with the big one. Of course this is the, well, the set analysis for Code of the Duelist. And uh, I'm going to perform, well, I'm going to present this uh, video slightly differently just so it's a little easier on my editing. Uh, so, aside from covering the main set we see here, I'll also go over the TCG exclusive and the OCG imports as quickly as possible. Because, uh, honestly, the sets aren't, aren't, the TCG exclusive is kind of interesting okay and uh for this video i will be going over the hype cards that are not archetype biased and then i'll go into the new archetypes the new supports then i'll go into the tcg exclusives and i'll probably talk about some cards that are actually generically useful that are pretty cheap that maybe you could pick up a couple of copies of all right guys so let's get to it so for hype cards secret rares here's a couple of secret rares or half the secret rares anyways we have rescue ferret we have spell book of knowledge which is an ultra rare and the other three Link monsters are all secret rares. We have Topologic Bomber Dragon, we have Firewall Dragon, of course, the cover card. And we have already seen what this guy can do. And we have uh, Gaia Saber, the Virtual Knight. And, okay, so I know it's okay. The names here are obviously um, Dueling Books old names that they haven't really changed yet but here we go so for rescue ferret rescue ferret is actually kind of an interesting monster it does require link monster to actually activate his effect and but when you do get rescue ferrets uh, effect off you can special summon uh onto those that link points link monsters pointers uh monsters totaling up to the level of six equaling to six actually and they have their effects negated but this card I don't know how much play we're going to see in this card in particular. It can be very useful to spam out stuff like Dandelions, uh, and then spam out more tokens and just go for a whole Link spam play. Um, I think it's still pretty useful, but price point wise, I think it, at Sneak Peek it's going to be about like 25 bucks or so, and uh, probably settling down around 15 It does seem a little situational, but if we do find ways to break it, it will spike up. Just be careful about this card. And the other card, the other card secret, we have Topologic Bomber Dragon and we have Firewall Dragon. Now both these cards, you should be very careful when you invest into these ones, especially uh, because they are main character cards. This is Revolver's uh, Big Dragon and we have Firewall Dragon, which we have not even seen in the anime yet as of now. It's 10 episodes in and Firewall Dragon's nowhere to be found. Kind of like when Stardust was missing. That's why I believe Yu-Gi-Oh! Frames and 5Ds had a lot of... Um, similarities because the way that the whole thing starts starts off pretty serious right right from the get-go and then aside from aside from that the main character still does not have his signature monster yet right now all he has is the code talker but anyways uh going into topologic bomber dragon this is revolver's dragon and um what this guy does is if another monster is special summoned onto a link zone uh, this thing points to or somewhere else to basically destroy all monsters in the main monster zone basically you get a full board wipe yeah it really really sucks uh, for your opponent getting hit by this effect if you special summon onto one of these link zone you can get a board wipe on your opponent which is going to be quite deadly but aside from that it has additional effects too which is whenever it battles a monster your opponent automatically gets also burned by that too so tons of effects with this guy and yeah i expect this guy topologic bomber dragon to be about 30 dollars or so on sneak peek and probably settling down around 20 to 25. if you do like the original copies of these cards well, they are very pretty and they are the very first uh, set of uh, link monsters and then we have for of course firewall dragon now firewall dragon a two plus monster for the recipe very easy to make you can use it with scapegoats to make this now you can target monsters uh, on the field or graveyard up to the number of monsters in a mutual link with this card mutual links means they are pointing to each other you got this side and this side pointing in and uh, if you get a mutual link with this you can return them to the hand and uh, this effect can only be used once while it's face up on the field and it's not a hard once per turn because it does not state the word name firewall dragon and uh the other effect about this card that i find kind of interesting and it's not once per turn is if a monster that this card points to is destroyed by battle or sent to the graveyard you can special summon one monster from your hand that's not once per turn this is the point where you can actually start spamming links like crazy the, of the ability to constantly search cards the ability to constantly retrieve cards like firewall dragon can help you retrieve a bunch of cards if you manage to get out firewall dragon start retrieving cards and you start linking off of firewall dragon's uh link pointers 
you're going to be spamming the board non-stop with monster summoning out from your hand, and that is what caused the Firewall Dragon Loop with, uh, of course, our favorite uh, Grand Soil Elemental Lord. I think that's the Elemental Lord. Yeah, so this card expected to be around 35, 40, yeah, 35, 40 uh, on release and probably settling down around 25. Now, about these two monsters, because they are main character monsters, be careful when you invest into these guys because main character monsters, we expect tins to come out for these monsters. Yes, so when tins come out, you can expect a serious tanking when it comes to these. And being a main character monster, it's never safe. Just look at, um, what was it, Odd Eyes Pendulum Dragon? He got a tin pretty soon after he was released. So more likely than not that these cards will get reprints relatively early. Next up we have uh, Gaia Saber with the Virtual Knight. This is a very generic monster. I have not much to talk about used for combo piecing. Uh, let's say he is... Well, I guess he is a... He's got his arrows pointed in neat positions. Like You can start off with him or you can put him uh, in the middle of a link chain or something like that. Uh, basically, he points downward so he always opens up play and he points sideways so he can always be in place in the middle. So he's got that advantage. Uh, as for the price point, I believe he's going to be around like 20 bucks on probably release and then probably suddenly around like 10 15 But he is used in multiple copies in some decks because he is the anchor point in the combo. Okay, so the ultra rare that comes in the set, we have a spellbook support. This is a spellcaster generic support, but if you do play spellbooks, you get that extra advantage of turning it into a destiny draw, which is spellbook of knowledge. It says spellbook of rudra, that's not the right name. We already get the TCG name, which is spellbook of knowledge. Send one, send to the graveyard one spellcaster type monster you control, or one spellbook card in your hand or field except for Spell Book of Knowledge. And if you do draw two cards, you can only activate one copy this per turn. This is actually a better version of Wonder Wand. Expect this card to, for an ultra rare. It actually is probably gonna be like 10 bucks for this card and might even hold its price. Uh, of course, if you do get flooded, that's a different story. Um, but even if it tanks, it's not gonna tank as hard as the, any of the other ultra rare cards. So this one might be much more useful, especially it is a draw engine card at the very least for spellcaster based decks. Anyways, that would be most of the hype cards. Let's go on to the archetypes. All right, guys. So starting off with the new type, Cybers. Now, Link Strike already introduced Cybers monsters to us with, of course, the entire extra deck that came with it. Uh, the Link Spider, the Honeybot, and the Decode Talker. But, and the Link Slayer, of course, the best monster in the entire starter deck. Now, you see here, the Cyber monster that came out in this set, we get five of them. We get Cyber Wizard, Backup Secretary, Stack Reviver, Launcher Commander, and Salvage and Driver. Uh, Salvage and Driver is an ultra rare, kind of a neat card. And when a Link monster you control is destroyed by battle or card effect by your opponent's card, basically, you can special summon this card from your hand. It's got 22, so a bit bigger body than Cyber Dragon. And uh, you can discard one spell card and target one cyber monster in your graveyard and special summon it. So I guess it has a bit of a revival effect. I'm guessing a lot of these cards do have uh, revival based effects. Now, Cyber's Wizard is one of the first monsters that our protagonist has summoned out. And I guess he has decent size. The 18 beater changes battle position, basically recoding them into defense position. And cyber monsters gain boost. They do synergize. Like, cyber monsters, they seem to just synergize just by having other cybers on the field, which is kind of neat. So it kind of feels like it's an archetype, but honestly, the effects are so generic and so basically blanketing towards the entire cybers archetype. I can't really pinpoint a pattern aside from, like, revival and special summon-based effects. Like, if you use, like, Stack Reviver as a Link Summon material, then you can target another Cyber's monster in the graveyard that was used for a Link Summon, Special Summon, that in defense. And basically, everything is based off of Special Summoning. And if you look at, well, Firewall Dragon, he's also based off of Special Summoning as well. So overall, uh, the type is currently, right, what we see is Summon Base. If you just remember Ram Clouder from Link's, uh, Link Strike, it's kind of the same idea. Now, on to the most hyped archetype of the set with an FTK to come with it, we have Trickstar. So it's been a while since we got an archetype that was burn based. Uh, aside from like Volcan, not even Volcanics. Volcanics wasn't exactly burn based as well, but this archetype here is strictly a burn based archetype. 
And of course, it does come with her own set of beaters as well, just to get you that much closer to killing off your opponent. We have Trickstar. Trickstar, they have their own Link monster, Trickstar Holy Angel, released in this set. This is the debut for this archetype, and it does have one hype secret. In fact, I think it's the most expensive secret in this entire set, which is uh, Trickstar Reincarnation. But we'll get over the, get into that in a bit. But the lineup we have, Trickstar Lily Bell, uh, I don't think she sees very much play. She's not important right now. At the moment when she's added to your hand except by drawing a special summon her and uh, she can attack directly and basically retrieve your uh, trickstar monster if she can deal battle damage. Okay, kind of a late game player, not exactly something you want to open with, but what you do want to open with is trickstar uh, Candina. Candina is just the Stratos of the deck, when you normal summon this card, you can add one Trickstar monster from your deck to your hand. And each time your opponent activates a spell or a trap card, yeah, you can burn your opponent for 200 damage uh, immediately. So I believe that is a continuous effect. It's, it does not activate. It's a continuous effect, so it applies a burn, basically adding additional damage to your opponent's card effects. But one of the most important cards in this entire deck is Trickstar. Uh, Lycoris. Lycoris is the main burn damage dealer with this card and it actually made cards like Dark Room uh, of Nightmare. Remember that old, old burn card? If it's if your opponent takes burn damage, you burn him again. Uh, she works very well with that card, synergizes very well. You can reveal this card in your hand and target one Trickstar monster you control, except for another uh, uh, Lycoris. And then you can special summon this card, then you can return that. And if you do return that monster to the hand, okay. So here's the thing about her, and the field spell is also very, very good. When this card is activated, you can add one Trickstar monster from your deck to your hand. Yeah, that immediately gives you the thought of, of course, activate Terraforming. Terraforming automatically acts as basically a search all, a double search, in fact, because you'll search one monster, you'll search uh, Candina. And then after you get like Candina, you'll get yourself a lic uh, Licorice. And if you get Licorice, therefore you get yourself the burning setup. And uh, what's crazy about uh, Candina is that she can add one Trickstar card from the deck to your hand. It's not just a monster, it's a card, so you can add uh, Trickstar Reincarnation, and that sets up a crazy burn. If you actually have enough copies of these cards, you can burn your opponent to death with, with an FTK, basically. Yeah, so kind of annoying that Konami is releasing an FTK uh, base, well, a deck that's capable of doing an FTK to your opponent. And of course, we have Trickstar Holy Angel. But let's talk about Reincarnation. Banish your opponent's entire hand, and if you do, they draw the same number of cards you banished. Uh, by you banish, it means because you were the one that banished their entire hand, they basically get to redraw their entire hand. But it does banish their hand, so it really, really sucks. There's two things you can do with this aside from like uh, comboing with Licorice. Licorice, uh, Lycoris, I don't know how to pronounce her name really. Um, each time a card is added to your opponent's hand, they burn 200 damage per copy, per card. So. A five card hand that automatically guarantees a 1000 burn and with the field spot every single time one of your trick star monster burns your opponent inflict another 200 damage to them so every single time they burn they burn more there's so much burn and then there's a card if i remember correctly present card your opponent ditches their entire hand and they draw five cards that's another 1000 burn but if you actually like uh have two copies of licorice on field that's that's uh well that's 2000 damage and on top of another 400 coming from this, uh, the light stage it's ridiculous of how much you can actually burn your opponent for and you can even feed your opponent even more cards and to ruin them but aside from just like setting up additional burns and you can manage this card from the graveyard and then special summon a trick star so lots of lots of good things about this card the other thing is, once you set up a chain where your opponent actually adds a card to their hand, you can throw a draw and lock bird and chain. You can chain this card, uh, I believe, behind a, um, I think a draw and lock bird. So in one order or another, your opponent basically ditches their entire hand, they have no cards to play with. That's another way of playing it. But normally you do just want to burn your opponent to death with this card. And of course they also have a link monster, they have trickstar holy angel, Trickstar Holy Angel, each time a Trickstar monster is normal summoned or special summoned into a zone, basically you burn your opponent. Again, more burn cards and Trickstar monsters that this card points to cannot be destroyed by battle card effects, so protecting your Trickstar burning. Uh, 
if you really want to just kill your opponent, you can also go for the attack as well, so that's what this card offers. But yeah, overall, this archetype is going to be really annoying. I recommend for you guys to look up replays and seeing why this card is so expensive. This card, I expect to be about $50 upon released sneak peek. And hopefully, I can see it dropping. But then again, it is facilitating an FTK, and it is a secret rare after all. So it could settle around 40 to like 40. But remember, this is archetype specific. Well, not exactly, but it is archetype specific and it doesn't exactly do too much for anyone else using it. So just be careful about this card. Um, I can see other applications with this card as well, especially if your opponent does search out a bunch of cards and you activate this card. They do banish their entire hand, which serves as a really strong interruption. They're not getting those cards back if you do banish them, so it does hurt them. So even as a generic card, it's not too bad. Um, Perhaps we'll see it settle down to maybe even lower once uh, this thing kind of gets rotated out. So another archetype that is shown in the show, which is Goki Monster. This is used by one of the best duelists in the show, apparently. And he plays apparently what they call an old school style of playing. And by old school, let me just try to explain that to you guys. Uh, every single time any of these monsters are sent to the graveyard, the main deck monsters anyway, when they're sent from the field to the graveyard, add a Goki Monster from the deck to the hand, uh, except for, well, the, the same copy, the same name. So whenever a Twisted Cobra sent to the graveyard, you can get yourself a Suplex. If Suplex sent to the graveyard, you can get either Cobra or like a Rising Scorpio. Basically, all these guys, um, uh, they basically fetch each other. So they have, they're very floaty, kind of like, I don't know, what's a deck that's kind of floaty like this? Um, I, I, I guess Digustos are kind of floaty like this. If you guys have a better example, yeah, you guys kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. It's a very floaty deck, and, well, it's a warrior-based deck, so you guys have all the warrior support that you'll need. You have Goki Twisted Cobra, during either player's turn, you tribute a Goki monster, and then target a Goki monster you control, and it gains attack equal to the tribute monster. So, it does not not say that uh, you can't target yourself for the tributing, so you can help them gain the 1600, so that there's a lot of damage type effect involved with this card, and... Like, you can only use each of these effects once per turn. I'm glad that they're actually making the once per turn thing a bit more uh, relevant. And whenever you normal summon out Suplex, you can special summon out another Goki monster from your hand. So this is just your, your tether monster. And if this monster is sent to the graveyard, again, nothing else very special about this. Very generic effects. No thing like mechanically defining. And then you have also Rising Scorpio. Rising Scorpio is uh, kind of like a Cyber Dragon. It's more like a Cyber Shark. When you control no monsters, or all monsters you control are Goki, you can normal summon this one uh, without tributing. And if this is card sent to the graveyard, again, same thing, the retrieval effect. So, overall, nothing too special. You have a damage increaser. This almost feels like better versions of Battle and Boxer, in my opinion, because at least these guys at least retrieve your cards. And then, what I find very impressive is that they have a boss monster that requires 2 plus Goki monster. It is a length 3, so, and it points... It has a good point. It basically opens up three zones for you, which is very nice. So, uh, all monsters on the field basically lose attack equal to their original defense, and all Goki monsters don't have defense, which is uh, why it does get hindered. And if this card would be destroyed by battle or card effect, you basically can protect it, kind of like Shien from 6M. You can destroy a monster this card points to instead. But I another card that I find very impressive would be the Goki Rematch. Goki Rematched is a double monster reborn. You special target two Goki monsters in your graveyard with different levels, and note that all these monsters have different levels right now upon release. You can special summon them in defense position. It's a double monster reborn. Of course, you can only activate one copy of this per turn. Can you imagine if you get multiple copies of this per turn? Holy crap, that would be so busted. Just like spam this card and just like spam a bunch of these guys, and there you have it a full board OTK. Let's go. But that's not gonna happen. Unfortunately, but this is all the this is all the support that you get with this uh, this archetype, which is very strange. A very short list of cards, four cards, but I guess because it is warrior based, so you do have basically all the warrior support from the past of Yu-Gi-Oh. But overall, nothing too expensive here. No secret rares.
All right, for the final archetype that's being introduced to us, this is going to be World Legacy, World Chalice. Uh, we are getting the World Chalice side of things, and this is basically a JRPG wrapped up in one whole archetype. We got our vanilla monster, we have our priestess, we have our, well, our swordsman guy, the chosen one, and we also have the beckon. I guess he's like the big brother guy. And then we also have like the little pet dragon, you know, the little adventure going on here. Let's go on adventure time. And of course we have a fairy, kind of like Link's Navi, we also have a plot device. And this whole archetype actually gains like the most amount of cards in terms of like an archetype introduction. We also have four Link monsters to go with it. So that's actually a pretty impressive lineup and we also have like two spells and one trap. And what I can tell you about this archetype is, this archetype is based off of spamming Link summoning. This whole synergizing play, it's a summon spam combo. These guys might be very generic and very like in terms of its type and type and uh, attribute, very distinct from each other. The only thing that they do share is a name. This guy's a warrior. This guy's a psychic, and this guy's a spellcaster. But this is all explained once you go into well the bottom uh, link of monsters. And uh, what I do want to talk about, aside from the vanilla guys, would be this guy here. This is the World Legacy's Guard Dragon. When a card or effect is activated that targets a link, um, a monster in a link state. I guess I guess this means it's pointed to. It's inside a link, or it's being pointed to. You can send this card from your hand to the or field to the graveyard to negate that activation. And if you do, you do destroy that card. So you do get the removal with a hand trap. And in addition to that, when this card is in your graveyard, you can actually banish it from your graveyard to target one normal monster in your graveyard and special summon out in defense mode to a link monsters. Wow, this wording is very awkward. Basically to a, a zone that a link monster points to and then you can only use uh, this effect once per turn. Well overall it's a pretty decent hand trap, it's a protection based hand trap. And what do we have here for the fairy Lee, the world chalice fairy? If this card is normal or special summoned, you can add one uh, world chalice monster from your deck to your hand. So this is your stratos and it goes for both normal and special, so a bit closer to Stratos, although the normal summon would kind of suck since she only has 100 attack points. So eh, kind of meh for that part. But uh, on the other hand, if this card is sent to your graveyard, you can send one monster from your hand or field to the graveyard and add this card back to your hand. So you get to recycle her, well, if you really want to. And uh, basically you can just refetch her. So basically she will be con she will mainly be your normal summon out of the deck. Unless of course you manage to successfully summon out uh, World Legacy, World Chalice. The plot device doesn't have any attack or defense, but this is I believe to be the one of the most important monsters in this thing. And it actually sets up all your combos. Luckily, there's only one guy here that is an, uh, a secret rare, and that's actually the boss monster I'll get into at the, at the end. Uh, if a monster is special summoned from the extra deck, you can tribute this card and send, well, that monster to the graveyard. See, this is very interesting. You put him on the board, it basically puts it to the point where your opponent cannot basically freely summon out any dudes. But this deck does work very well with uh, Rescue Rabbit, considering that all these guys are vanillas. And um, you see here, if this card, uh, if this face-up card uh, that was normal summon or set leaves a field, you can special summon two World Chalice monsters from your deck. Basically, when this guy leaves the field, you immediately get to spam out two monsters. You can spam out two of these 18 beat sticks, or maybe you can spam out two of these two different guys. And of course, when in your main phase, except for the turn that this card was sent to the graveyard, you can banish it and then basically search yourself another uh, World Chalice card including himself so yeah lots of synergies lots of summoning spam lots of like refueling your hand although these guys don't exactly have significant like uh board impacting effects it's still pretty interesting of, to see what they're capable of now then they have their spell lineup you have uh the world chalice discovery and you also have world chalice aegis discovery is the field spell um gives you the deck a bit more floatiness especially when one of your monster uh your world chalice monster is destroyed by battle or leaves the field because of your opponent's card effect you can target one uh, World Chalice Monster in your graveyard and special summon. It gives you that extra floatiness so that when your monster is destroyed, it does tether into and lead into another monster. So it, it has been, makes them a bit more sticky. And 
As for the Aegis, target two World Chalice monsters with different names in their graveyard and then add them to your hand. Okay, well, that basically is a plus one. If a Link monster you control uh, in the Link state, I'm guessing in the Link zone, uh, would be destroyed by battle, you can banish this card instead. So basically it gives you that protection. But most cards right now do have multiple effects. This is World Legacy's Beacon. And you can banish one World Legacy monster from your hand or face up on your side of the field, and then you can target uh, two monsters in your graveyard and special summon them. The monster can be whatever you want, so you can even get back your Link monsters as well. I think that's actually one of the points of this card. And now onto the Link lineup for this, we have the Dragon, which is the Link 1, Imduk, they actually give you their names now, and then we have Ib, it's I-B. The Maiden, we have uh, the Orum, which is the Swordmaster, and then we have the Warrior, which is Ningrisu. Ningrisu is the secret rare. Expect this guy to be about 20 bucks and on the release and probably settling around 15 unless it becomes meta. If it's meta, you expect this guy to strip to 40. But uh, I don't know how meta this guy actually is because I'm looking at OCG stats and I'm not seeing too many of these guys being played. Mainly because it does feel very cluttery that you have to play a bunch of vanillas. If you play too many vanillas, you usually get that inconsistent hand. And that's why I don't think they're doing so well. Now as for Imduck, Imduck it points upwards for a Link 1, which is kind of interesting. That means you don't usually go into him by himself. And uh, you can just link him with a one normal monster except for a token. Now during your main phase, you can normal summon out uh, additional uh, Star World uh, World Chalice monster, so it gives you the additional summon, which is actually kind of neat. And um, whatever this thing battles, whatever it points to that it battles, uh, that monster basically gets destroyed. Yeah, so it's got a bit of destruction, even though it has 800 attack, it's okay. And all of these Link monsters has the effect of special summoning out a World Chalice monster from your hand when sent from the field to the graveyard, so that's their quirk. And Maiden requires two monsters with different attributes, so there you have it, that's why the entire lineup of monsters, they all share different attributes. And she's the protector, doesn't let things that she points to be destroyed, and... If, again, she has that uh, that protection effect and that uh, tethering effect when she's sent to the grave. Orum is two star girl monster linked to, so this guy probably would be one of your go-to link monsters. Um, gains a 300 attack for every single world chalice monster in your graveyard, and then you can tribute uh, one world chalice monster that this card points to, and then you can special summon out another one from your graveyard for the other zone that you point to. Kind of interesting, I guess, summoning effect. But what I find more interesting would be Ningrisu. Ningrisu is, um, requires two Link monsters to make. So he's a bit pricier, but you usually would only use two Link monsters. You use a Link 2 and a Link 1 to make him. When this card is Link Summon, you draw cards equal to the number of star, uh, World Chalice monsters this card points to. So he immediately pays for himself if you get him pointing in the right direction. And holy crap, if you actually summon him dead center, you're you're gonna be in a really good spot. But it is I don't know how likely you're gonna do that because looking at the links available, there's no way that you can get him straight down, pointing downwards. Um you're going to need someone else to actually support this kind of summoning. But also, the other effect is that once per turn, you can send one monster from each player's side of the field to the graveyard. So you send one from theirs and one from yours, and then that's it. That's his effect. He is a secret rare after all. That effect actually synergizes with your plays because you do want to send your monsters to the graveyard to get that extra summoning effect. Or for your opponent, they're just losing a monster. It's not destruction based or anything, so that is good for you. And also, it is um, non-targeting, so you got that advantage going too. Alright guys, so for the latest support of Supreme King Dragons and Supreme King, uh, yeah, Supreme, Supreme King Dragons, and if you have been playing with the new uh, Magicians, this is one of the more interesting things for you guys because this is the best support for you guys, although it is a little bit late since we have moved on to the Link format, which means all these extra deck monsters will eat up your extra monster zone, but how many of these will you actually spam out? Well, unfortunately, your trap is not going to be as effective because you can't spam out a bunch of dragons without having all your link zones open. So, yeah, this card kind of sucks now. It makes Zarks even worse. However, that being said, you are gaining a bunch of Dark Pendulum uh, material recipe based uh, 
synchros, Xyz, and fusion. And we're gonna get Odd Eyes, which is a better version of Odd Eyes. It has a similar effect, but makes it a little bit more uh, effective on the field. Basically, you can get your search immediately by tributing a Supreme King Dragon Monster and blowing this card up, and you can immediately add that 1500 attack or less monster from the deck to your hand. And I believe that this does allow you to search for some of the magicians that you already have. Um, as for the fusion, the fusion lets you either fusion summon it or just tribute the monsters above to make them out. So it's kind of like um, uh, Dynaster. For, yeah, for the true Draco, well, not true Draco, but the Draco Slayer. Yeah, but it's kind of like Dynaster, and uh, basically it just has Starving Venom's effect and you inflict piercing damage. This is the Clear Wing, destroy all face of monster your opponent controls when this card is Synchro Summoned. So that's, I guess, kind, kind of neat. Um, you, get a, you get a Lightning Vortex upon summoning, and once per turn when this card battles the opponent's monster before damage calculation, you destroy that monster, and then you can just burn them. Wow, okay. And uh, if this card is in your graveyard, you can tribute two Supreme King Dragon Monsters to special this card back out. So, yeah, kind of neat. Kind of kind of sacky, kind of weird. Kind of neat effects. All these monsters, of course, aside from like Starving Venom Dragon, they all kind of have the same stat line. They all have 2,000 defense. And as for the Dark Rebellion, Dark Rebellion basically can zero out the monster basically to take full damage after you absorb their attack. And the additional effect is that... Uh, during either player's turn, you can. During either player's battle phase, you can uh, return this card from the to the extra deck, and then special summon out two Supreme King Dragon or Supreme King Gate cards from your uh, Pendulum Monsters from your extra deck in defense position. Similar effect to well, uh, All Ice Pendulum Dragon. So it's kind of neat. Alright guys, so DDD monsters also get some support, so we get DD uh, Vice Typhon, this is a snake monster with an arm for a snake, haha, <laughs> snake arm, but anyways, uh, this monster has a normal summon effect that lets her tether out a DD monster, but this is the only support that they're getting in, in terms of a normal monster, but then she has a graveyard effect that kinda acts like a necro slime, so you get additional fusion summoning from the graveyard using graveyard material, which is actually kinda nice. Next up we have... DDD Wave High King Executive Caesars. This is a rank 6, which is not likely for you to actually make this guy, but if you do control two Genghis at the same time, you can overlay into this. And this guy is a summon wall. Any spell, trap, or monster effect that includes the effect of special summoning a monster, you can detach one, negate, and destroy. So that is actually kind of neat. And then um, you can make this card and one other DD card you can control gain 1800 attack points until the end of this turn. So if this card is sent to the graveyard, um, you can add one dark contract card to the graveyard. So it has some synergy, even though it's very expensive for you to actually make him, it's still worth your time to make because he does uh, recover some cards for you. And of course we have the uh, Executive Alexander. So when there's three or more DDD monsters on the field, man, I hate saying DDD, um, basically this card gains 3,000 attack points, so putting him at 6k, that can basically run over almost every single monster except for Armatile, but uh, yeah, and also has the special summon clause, which is when this card you fa face up, you control, is on the field, and you summon a special summon a DD monster onto the field, you can special summon a DD monster from the graveyard. So yeah, that's about it. Now this is the most anticipated, I guess, archetype, which would be the Twilight Swarms. If you're a fan of Light Swarms back in the day, this is probably the archetype for you because it adds the Light Swarm deck a little bit more depth. Now yeah, you can actually play with the stuff in your graveyard. So we have Jane, Lila, Lumina, and Raiko. Okay, so about these guys, and of course even JD had a thing. Now we have PD, we have P Diddy and G Dragon. G Dragon P Diddy. Okay, anyways. Uh, Jane. Jane Twilight Sworn General. Now, if you guys remember what Jane did in the previous uh, Light Sworn era, Jane boosted her own attack by. Um, well, whenever she attacks, she gained 300 attack. But this time is the exact opposite. Once per turn, you can banish one Light Sworn monster from your hand or graveyard which is kind of neat, and then you can target one face-up monster on the field. It loses 300 attack and defense, equal to the level of the banished monster. So that is huge. You can actually well, lower the stats even further, so that's kind of nice. And if another Light Sworn monster activates their effect, 
uh, send the top two cards to the graveyard. So you can still get the milling effect. So Jane actually seems actually pretty decent, uh, since you can actually trigger the mill pretty early. And uh, Light Sworn, of course, includes all Twilight Sworns as well, because the name Light Sworn kind of is enveloped in Twilight Sworn. Now we have Lila, the Light Sworn Enchantress. Now she has a witch hat now. It's kind of cute. Uh, she seems a bit more mature now. And I like the contrast of these cards, man. It's, it's really nice. But there seems like the symbol around in the background of the card, it has a bit more like, has a little anchory feel. It has that look of Minerva almost. Like, it has like that pattern that's... You guys, you, you guys can see it just pointed out. Now, once per turn during either player's turn, when a spell or trap card is activated, you can banish one light sworn monster from your hand or graveyard. Target one uh, face up spell or trap card on the field. Destroy it. Hmm. I kind of don't like this effect. It's not very effective. Of course, we have Lumina. This card's a secret rare. Unfortunately, this is going to be probably the weakest secret rare of the entire set. Don't pay more than... Well, at sneak peek, it could be around 20 bucks, but probably will drop to 8 or so, 8 to 10. I could be wrong. Is it really meta? I don't think it's actually that meta. Once per turn, you can banish one Light Sworn monster from your hand or graveyard. Target one of your banished Light Sworn monsters, except Lumina, the Twilight Sworn Shaman, and then you get Special Summon it. Once per turn, uh, if another of your Light Sworn activates, basically, they're getting their effects triggered from another lights one activating so it's you need to pair it with another lights one so i guess one of the strongest monsters to actually get these things off would be minerva and uh the other guy would be raiden raiden would, these two guys would be the best to trigger everything off and we also have raiko the twilight sworn hunter which is the twilight sworn fighter uh if this card is normal summon or flip face up uh banish one lights one monster control and then banish one card in the field this card is really good i think it's just a free banish and uh, it doesn't target. And if another Light Sworn would activate, you also get to mill three cards. Yeah, Raikou is definitely going to be one of the best removers in the game. With a non-targeting non banishing effect, I think that's that's actually really good. Next up, we have Punisher Dragon. If you have control three, four or more Light Sworn monsters are banished with different names. So it's rather than being in the graveyard, they're all banished. You can special summon this card and then you can uh, pay a thousand life points to shuffle every single card in the graveyard and all the face up cards uh, that are banished back into the deck except light sword monsters so you can still spam more punishment dragons out onto the field and go for a big ass otk but you don't nuke the board so you might want a jd in there too so we'll go jd nuke the board punishment dragon punish your opponent and then dish out even more punishment i, I guess i don't know how this is gonna work and of course if another light sword monster activates you mill four cards See, the milling effect is kind of neat here. You're actually not going to mill yourself to death now. You're not going to be forced to do that. And instead of uh, Charge of the Light Brigade, we get March of the Dark Brigade. Um, well, target a Light Sword monster in your graveyard, add it to your hand, and then banish cards equal to the monster's original level. Doesn't seem very epic to me. But then the banishing... Because see, this is, the thing here is the banishing seems a little bit random. And what if you actually banish something that you do want to keep? Now you're forced to run a deck that doesn't have as much utility. And then you have Twilight Dragon spell card. If you control a J Punishment Dragon, you can target a JD in your graveyard, add it back to your hand, and then send four cards to the graveyard. If this card is milled, then you can, well, banish four cards and uh, basically target a, a Punishment Dragon in the graveyard and add it to your hand. So uh, basically a JD Searcher or a PD Searcher. And then you have the traps. The traps are a bit interesting. See, Light Swords weren't known to run traps, and these two traps basically have mill effects as well as on field effects. The mill effects of claw clothes basically gives you immunity and protection, but also it helps you gain attacks. So it's a damage step based trap. And Eraser lets you banish two cards uh, on the field, basically. Pretty neat stuff. That would be the Twilight Swarm. Basically, you get to play with the aspect of banishing cards along with your milling so basically you fuel the milling with the light sworn and then you banish it with the twilight sworns going into the tcg exclusives we have fa's and we have vendred now vendred is a ritual based archetype that has five cards to support it one of them being the sneak peek entry card and uh okay what does this card do exactly well uh if this card is in your graveyard you can actually discard a vendred card and then special summon it back out okay so it, it summons itself back out but it doesn't have any attack so I don't know what, it, what I think about it, but the other part about it is that it offers a ritual monster, a ventured monster uh, effects 
and the effect that it gains is that you can target one spell or trap card your opponent controls and banish it. And that's a quick effect. So you get double the amount of banishing, I guess, over a two turn course. One on your turn, one on your opponent's turn. Pretty good against True Draco. As for the other card, Vengeance Revenants, I think it's a pretty decent monster. It's 18 beat stick, and whenever it's destroyed by your opponent's card, uh, basically you can special summon it back out. So it serves as two body. And the effect that it offers to its Ritual Master is that it can target a special summon monster on your opponent's controls yeah, and then banish it. So basically, this guy can now uh, banish spells and traps, banish monsters. And what do you do by default? You can banish a zombie monster from your graveyard, and uh, this card gains 300 attack. Okay, that's kind of neat. If this Ritual Summon card is sent to the graveyard, you can add one Ritual Spell from the deck to the hand, and then if you do send one Vendrin monster from the deck to the graveyard. Okay, so I'm guessing that the Ritual Spell can also banish from the graveyard. That's just my guess for felt looking. Um, I think this deck could actually synergize with Shira Noise. That's my guess. Maybe that's why Shira Noise is actually kind of getting a bit more expensive. But that's just my guess. And then uh, Vendred Reorigin, that's the trap. I actually find it pretty interesting, but let's go over to the Ritual Spell first. Ritual Spell, if this card is... Uh, this card can be used to Ritual Summon a Vendred mon Ritual Monster from the hand or Graveyard. So it actually can revive it from the Graveyard. That's actually kind of neat. That means you don't need to run too many copies of this big boy here. And uh, you can ba also... Uh, tribute monsters from your hand or field, or banish zombie monsters from your graveyard, whose total level is equal to or exceeds. Okay, so yeah, basic ritual summon gibberish. And then we have if a vengeance slayer you control will be destroyed by battle or card effect, you can banish this card instead. So it has protection as well. So that actually, that's pretty decent if you ask me for a ritual based deck. It's no Nec Necroz, but it's not too bad. And then we also have Vendred uh, Reorigin, which is the trap card. You can actually target one of your opponent's face up monster with a level, tribute it. Tributing is actually a very key word here. And if you do summon one Vendred token uh, with a level equal to that. So I can understand why it says tribute because it just means that even if it's uh, banished by the card effect, at least it will still summon out the token with the level. So it's guaranteed to summon the token. That's what the tributing is for. And while you control that token, you can only normal or special summon out Vendred monsters. So you can still set other monsters or tribute set over that token if you want to. So overall, not too bad. I actually kind of like the archetype. And then we have the Speed Racers archetype. We have uh, FA Hold Hang On Mock, and we have uh, Sonic Meister. These guys, I think, is kind of interesting. You're literally playing a game of shifting gears. The gears meaning the levels. You can constantly increase the levels of these guys. And uh, when they hit level 7, so once you hit gear 7, you gain an additional effect. So for Hang On Mock, uh, when this card is level 7 or higher, has a continuous effect of any card your opponent sent to the graveyard is banished instead. And this card gains attack equal to its level, so if it hits level 7, it would be 21 Dark Law. And as for the other guy, um, what do you do? You get a second attack. Okay, that's kind of neat. And each time, for both of these cards, each time uh, an FA spell or trap, uh, card or effect is activated. So even if you activate it from the graveyard, you can increase its level by one Okay, so that's kind of neat. So what does the spell and trap do? So uh, we have FA circuit Grand Prix so all FA monsters on the field basically have the their levels increased by two during the battle phase only so when it's racing then you get the uh, you get the additional two levels, so you're actually speeding, basically starting you at a base level 6, so 6 times 3, you get 1800 beat stick with the field spell. Otherwise, you're kind of a measly 12, not too good. Okay, but anyways, like, looking onto the other part of this field spell, and, uh, if an FA monster destroys a monster by battle, you can draw one card. That's actually a really good effect, it, it offers you a bit more synergy, and let's see what else we got here. Um... If this face-up card on the field is destroyed by a card effect, you can add one FA card from the deck to your hand. So, yeah. so when you, if your opponent does blow it up, it does have a bit of a recovery play for you. It does offer you that that recovery. Anyways, let's see the quick play spell. Of course, it's like a quick play spell. You are racing after all, and seeing that this car does not exist 
in our current lineup of monsters. I'm guessing that's coming up in the next set, this little dark car. Uh, target one Effie monster you control increases level by two until the end of the turn. During your main phase, except for the turn it was sent to the graveyard, you banish this card. Target one Effie monster increases its level by two again. So, okay, this card basically offers you additional four levels if you use them all. Well, not all at once, but like a total of four levels over a period of two turns. Uh, pretty decent card. You can actually surprise your opponent. Now, remember that this card does not allow you to activate it during the damage step, even though the card would result in the, the monster gaining levels and increasing attack, but this card does not directly affect the attack. So don't forget, there's no damage step for this card. But in the end, it's still a very decent card. If you actually go attack your opponent with a Hang On Mock, your Hang On Mock will go to level... Uh, five and then gain the additional two levels which would put him at level seven which turns into a banishing machine or you can do about um well you can do a lot of damage with this card you can put hit him for about 4200 just with this card alone so yeah overall these cards aren't too bad i actually like the uh, the archetype i'm actually looking forward to seeing the different kinds of support because this is actually changing how we play with the levels regarding these cards maybe we'll finally get a link monster who knows maybe it requires like two level seven link monsters or something like that that's just my prediction and as for the final remaining TC, uh, OCG imports, we have Junk Breaker, Infernity, Patriarch, we have a Asteria and Dexia, we have uh, uh, Chilam Sabak, we have Ancient Gear, Golem, Ultimate Pound, and we have uh, Destiny Hero, Dangerous, we have Galaxy Worm, Performable Trump Panda. Uh, I believe that is Speed War Passing Rider, and we have uh, one of the Abyss Actors. That's not too much I really can talk about about these guys. I don't think any of these guys are hyped up too much, unless you guys are super looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to this guy, personally, because he's kind of neat. And as for the remaining useful cards, I kind of want to talk about in this set, just to give you guys cards that you maybe want to hold on to. Alright, last few cards are pretty useful. Zombina is a generic graveyard revival. Uh, no real condition about this card aside from your opponent needs to destroy it by battle or card effect. Yeah, it can revive any level 4 or lower monster from your graveyard, so it can be abused. We have Cracking Dragon that's kind of like a mini slifer. It lowers the attack of whatever monster your opponent summons by 200, and this card cannot be destroyed by battle by anything lower than its own level, which is kind of neat. Even though it has zero defense, your opponent still needs a level 8 monster or a rank monster or a link monster to kill it. Okay, so that pretty much covers that. It's also one of the first monsters seen in Yu-Gi-Oh! Reigns in the anime. Next we have uh, Party Pairing Knight. So if Disco Stew went to Yu-Gi-Oh! Okay, that was pretty... That was really bad. Don't quote me on that. That was holy... Holy crap, that was terrible. Uh, it's just really hot in here. Uh, when you take battle damage from your opponent attacking, uh, basically what happens is you can special summon this card from your hand and you can also special summon another monster. Basically... Uh, with attack less than or equal to the damage you took. Um, not sure how useful this is, maybe you can use it for synchro material, you can use it for whatever, but I just thought that this card is just wow, wow, pretty damn awesome! Look at him, look at he's got that whole fro going on, the sunglasses, like hard gay, it's, it's pretty neat. And we got the, we got the chick with the, with the bikini and whatever. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a pretty neat card if you ask me. And the artwork, I think it would look really nice with a, uh, with a friend donkey in there. It, it just somehow screams it needs a friend donkey in this image. Uh, that's why I decided to feature this card here. Now, Defense Zone uh, is one of my favorite cards in this whole set because it allows anti-meta players to play. Anti-meta players, you should pick up this card uh, for good reason. And once we get the card Metaverse, you'll eat like it even more. But basically, it offers you back row protection for both you and your opponent. But you don't have to care about your opponent's back row. All you gotta do is care about using Defense Zone to protect your safe zone that is also protecting your... Uh, fossil Dyna or your barrier statue, whatever that you have. Yeah, that is the combo that I've been going on and on about. It is really, really good. Super annoying. Think about it this way. Twin Twister, logically, can only hit one card. With Defense Zone, if you have a monster in front of a spell and trap that you control, it cannot be destroyed by card effects and cannot be targeted. 
which adds an additional level of frustration for your opponent, especially with Save Zone Fossil Dyna. It is one of the most annoying things for your opponent, and holy crap, if you put a Moon Mirror Shield on that too, and you have another monster in front of that, let's just say uh, Rage Quit City is just basically one step away. Another really hype card here is Heavy Dust Storm. Target two Spiral Trap cards on the field, destroy them. A lot of people already talked about it. It is basically a free Twin Twister at the cost of a battle phase, but if you're gonna do it during your opponent's turn, who cares? It's not even once per turn. Um, yeah, so pretty good against uh, back row heavy decks, especially going first. You can prepare it and blow it up before it gets out of control. Next up, we have return to the front lines or uh, back to jump to the front or whatever it's called. Uh, target one monster in your graveyard special summon defense mode. Just doesn't work on lake monsters and gnomies, but aside from that, it's a very generic monster reborn that you have access to. And Marauding Captain is getting tossed right now, so it really sucks for him. But overall, this is a very good card especially if you play anti-meta i'm playing it inside my no fun zone version like when your opponent activates a card to special summons they call the haunted or something like that you chain return to the front lines revive your own fossil dyna shut your opponent off and uh yeah it's not affected by like twin twisters or cosmic cyclones or msts it basically is a guaranteed revival so because it is not a continuous spell and next up we have recall which is the dark bribe version of uh what is it it's not, not Dark Bribe version. It is, yeah, it is the Dark Bribe version of a for monster effects. So your opponent gets to draw a card, and that is about it. And then they get to, their monster effect negated and destroyed. So if you can't pay for Solemn Strike, you can play Recall. But note that Solemn Strike is also getting uh, reprinted as well. And I think Solemn Strike is still just much, much better. And as for a monster here, um, let me put it here. Uh, we have Mrs. Radiant, which is if you're playing Zodiac, Zodiac, you guys want to play this as your Link monster because it is Earth, it is Link 2, and it is very easy for you to actually take advantage of this. And uh, you can target one Earth monster in your graveyard and add it to your hand. Yeah, this card is pretty damn decent if you ask me. It's definitely one of the better cards if you want to play Zoo. And if Zoo doesn't get hit, well, let's just say Mrs. Radiant is one of the monsters that you don't want to miss out in your deck. And that basically covers everything I really want to talk about this. It is really hot in here. I have two lamps running while it is like hella hot. I think I'm done here. So if you guys enjoyed this video, hit me up with a thumbs up. If you guys want to see more stuff from MSD.TV, please hit the subscribe button. I got my uh, no fun zone thing coming up very, very soon. I hope to show that to you guys. Uh, just so that anti-meta is back in the scene and uh, we'll see what happens. See how many people it gets frustrated. Because I know for a fact that anti-meta will shut out the Trickstar deck, it'll shut out Zoo, it'll shut out a lot of decks, but we need Metaverse. Once we get Metaverse, the deck is closer to completion. But anyways, until next time, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV, and I'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please drop us a like so we know we are doing a good job. And you can also subscribe to MSD.TV for more fantastic videos by clicking on the button on the left. Don't forget to check out our partners at Imperium Duelist. They make really high quality mats, including some of my own limited edition release stuff. And if you want to check out one of our past videos, click here on the right. As always, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV and I'll see you next time.